difference One cup at a time So be sure to grab your tea Grab a seat And tune in to Miss Liz Tea time Making a difference One cup at a time Well, welcome to Tea Time. It's Tea Time with Miss Liz. That's right. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be out there in this incredible world that we call home. I just want to give a little disclaimer, and then we're going to introduce the incredible Lisa Skinner, who will be sharing on Alzheimer's and dementia and a bunch of other brain illnesses out there in the world to Kate and bring awareness, because awareness is the key. Disclaimer for Miss Liz. Miss Liz is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to use your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any of the tea times hosted by Miss Liz myself is always brought forward in good faith, however, may bring forth dialogue and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the given time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participation are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussion for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion form only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is now providing, not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, or the participants or panelists discussion, you may freely contact Miss Liz myself through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in the show in any aspect, Miss Liz welcomes you. Should you decide that this show is not for you at this time, I respect that choice and I welcome you back at a later date. Now, I'm going to introduce the incredible Lisa Skinner. I'm going to bring her up and then I'm going to introduce her bio and that. So I'm going to bring her into the studio. We're going to do things a little different today because I'm just all over the place for some reason. I'm not sure why, but I am. So Lisa Skinner is an incredible, incredible lady. Um, I reached out to Lisa to know and understand more about Alzheimer's uh, This topic is close to home and is personal as well for myself. So thank you, Lisa, for opening that door and coming today. So a little bit on Lisa. Lisa is a behavior expert in Alzheimer's disease and other related dementia. She has been a community counselor, a regional director of senior care facility and trainer, speaker and private advisor, helping thousands of families and caregivers understanding the daunting challenges of brain disease for over 25 years. She holds a degree in human behavior. She offers counter initiative solutions and tools to help people effectively manage the system, the symptoms of brain disease, using some real life examples to help increase understanding. She has also had eight of her own family members affiliate, affiliate with dementia. So she has experienced it from many angles. All of this experience led her to write the two-time best-selling book, Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost, available on Amazon, which offers guidance for those who must deal with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. She also regularly writes a blog under the same title on Facebook. Her favorite logo is Nike logo and slogan, Just Do It. Her favorite color is purple, and the best word to describe her is a doer. So welcome, Lisa. It is an honor to have you in my studio today. I'm just going to lead the, and let you lead the way and share all this good stuff now. Okay. Hi, Liz. It's such a pleasure <laughs> to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. I think this is a really critical and important time to raise awareness about Alzheimer's disease and dementia um, because the World Health Organization as well as the Alzheimer's Association are projecting that the number of people who will develop 
Alzheimer's disease in the next 20 to 30 years is going to double from the numbers of people who are suffering from it today. Uh, this is going to be a new world crisis if we don't find a cure. And I don't think we're very close to a cure. I know there's a lot of clinical trials that are going on out there right now. But um, one of the things that I feel is very important, especially um, when we're faced with the kind of numbers that we're looking at over the next 20, 30 years, is for people to have a better understanding of what living with this disease is truly like. Um, as Liz mentioned, I've had eight of my own family members. Three of them have been blood relatives and three of them have been through marriage. And they've all been on my mother's side. Well, most of them, uh, with the exception of one or two. So it runs in my family. And that puts me at a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease than somebody who hasn't had so many family members um, develop Alzheimer's disease. So I'm very aware of my risk factors and I'm very aware of, um, you know, the risk that I have to develop this disease. And unfortunately, there's nothing I can do about it other than implement lifestyle changes and do some things that can lower my risk. But where I'd like to start off is letting you know that my very first experience with this disease was with my grandmother. And I was a teenager. She developed um, Alzheimer's disease. Back then, they referred to it as senile dementia, but um, it's either similar or the same disease, but they didn't call it Alzheimer's back then. They called it senile dementia. And I would visit her regularly because I only lived a few miles from her. And I started to visit her and she would tell me about birds living in her mattress and that they would come out of her mattress while she was asleep and peck at her face. Wow. She told me that rats um, ran along her walls all night long. She told me that she was always afraid for her life because these men were trying to break into her home to harm her. I mean, these were like unbelievable stories. But my grandmother had no reason to lie. I, I never knew her to be a dishonest person. She was the sweetest, most demure, soft-spoken lady. And then all of a sudden, I'm hearing these stories. I even went to the extreme one day of pushing her mattress up from her bed and saying, Grandma, look, I, there's nothing under the mattress. There's no holes. Where are these birds coming from? And she says to me, Oh, they're very clever, Lisa. They're very clever. They're there. You just don't see them right now, but they're very clever. So this was my very first experience, hearing these false beliefs, these delusions that she was having. She also had the hallucinations of the rats, and she had the paranoia that's very a very common behavior with Alzheimer's disease. And I believed it was pretty far-fetched, but she was very, very convincing. And now, almost 50 years later, in my professional career as a, a behavior specialist and a counselor, I'm seeing a lot of these behaviors with people. And I've counseled over a thousand families in my 25 plus year career. And I think of uh, what I've noticed is things haven't changed that much since my very first experience with my grandmother. As far as people's awareness, I'm getting the same issues, the same questions, the same um, paradigm with people now as, as we did back then. As a matter of fact, my, my grandmother was calling the police 
three or four times a day to report all of her delusions. And at first, of course, they believed her and they would send a patrolman out. And, you know, they just concluded that there was absolutely nothing there that she was claiming was there. So they, they came over to our house and they told my mother, you need to do something with your mom. Uh, she's they, and they, the police officer that was speaking to my mother called her a nut says she is a nut. And I was so incensed by that because I knew there was something wrong with her. She wasn't a nut. She had never been a nut. There was something wrong with her. My, I've seen this change. I've seen this decline in her. And, you know, it just goes to, to show how unprepared they were for this disease, having somebody call and make all these claims that they were afraid for their life. And that was um, awakening moment for me that he referred to her as a nut instead of, I don't know, maybe being a little bit more aware of um, senile dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And I haven't seen that much change in the last 50 years. Um, I think people are now really finally starting to be willing to talk about it. There are documentaries out, there are movies out, um, some of the soap operas on TV are showing family members with dementia. Some of the mainstream television series are. So this is a good time for people to really start learning more about what it's truly like to live with dementia, especially when we're going to be seeing the number of people double in the next 20 to 30 years. And part of that is because the baby boomer, boomer generation is reaching, has actually now reached the age where Alzheimer's disease will begin to show up. The, the oldest baby boomers are in their mid seventies. The youngest baby boomers are in their early sixties. This is a disease that typically shows up after the age of 65 and wow. We are a huge generation, probably the largest generation of human in human history. I think that has a lot to do with um, the numbers that we will see of people develop this disease. But there's also a lot of extraneous um, factors that are contributing to the development of Alzheimer's disease that are out of our control. So I think that's why the, the projections of the numbers are, are so staggering. And my feeling about it is we need to be prepared. And the other thing that's changed the landscape is the impact that COVID disease has had on uh, the elderly and especially the elderly that are suffering from one of the brain diseases that causes dementia. Uh, there's been a shift in the last couple of years to uh, families trying to uh, do the care from home because they're, they're worried about the facilities because in the last two years, we've seen a lot of COVID run through assisted living facilities and memory care facilities and nursing homes. So we're seeing a, a, a definite shift in how um, our elderly are going to be taken care of. So there's a lot going on right now. And I think the, from what I've seen in the 25 years that I've been doing this, I think people's lack of understanding about the disease is the primary reason uh, that things really haven't changed. So um, we need to talk about it. We need to offer solutions to um, how to care for the people that are, will be developing Alzheimer's disease in the next 25, 30 years. And um, basically in a nutshell, we all need to be prepared because it's going to impact many, many, many families in the years to come. And it'll sneak up on us very, very quickly. So what have you learned about Alzheimer's and your family members, Lisa? 
on a personal level? Well, between my career and my personal experience with my family, um, I have learned so much about the disease that a lot of people aren't aware are actually part of the disease. Most people relate having Alzheimer's disease to memory loss and confusion. And that is very true. The hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is short-term memory loss. And really? Really? yes, that's the wow. first part of the brain that Alzheimer's disease attacks is the short term memory and uh, losing your memory causes a lot of confusion. But it's so much more complicated than that. There are so many other behaviors that are the, that accompany the disease. There are so many other um symptoms that accompany the, the disease and where it really gets complicated. And uh, most people aren't aware of this is it's not that uncommon for people to be suffering from more than one brain disease at the same time. So let me just clarify that real quickly. Alzheimer's disease and dementia are not the same thing. A lot of people believe that Alzheimer's disease is one specific disease and that dementia is a separate specific disease. So let me just clear that up because this will make a lot more sense to you. Yeah. So Alzheimer's disease is a brain disease. And it's one of over a hundred brain diseases that exist that cause dementia. So when we're using the term dementia, we're really referring to um, the set of symptoms that accompany one of the brain diseases that causes it. And Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of brain disease that causes dementia. There are probably over 100 symptoms and behaviors that go along with the disease and everybody experiences it differently. So when you're describing to somebody that you're not feeling well and you start talking about the symptoms that you're having, I have a fever and I have body aches and I have chills, you're really referring to the symptoms that belong to some virus or disease that you have. Mm -hmm. That's what dementia is. So instead of going through all of the symptoms and behaviors that accompany brain disease, we just refer to it as an umbrella term, but it's really referring to the symptoms and the behaviors that accompany brain disease. There are, like I said, there are over a hundred. The most common ones that people are aware of is number one, Alzheimer's disease. There's Parkinson's disease. There's Lewy body disease. Um, there's frontotemporal lobe dementia. These are some of the more common ones. There's vascular dementia, which is very common, but it's not a brain disease. It has the same symptoms that uh, Alzheimer's with some variations, but vascular dementia is caused when people have either a stroke or what's called transchemic um, attacks, TIAs, and they're really referred to as mini strokes. So that's actually damaging the brain because when you have a mini stroke or a regular stroke, your brain bleeds and then damages those, those cells. So that's, so when somebody um, has that, then that's called vascular dementia and the behaviors and the symptoms that we see are very similar. So back to what I was saying, somebody can be suffering from more than one brain disease um, or vascular dementia at the same time. So for example, somebody could be, could have had a series of trans ischemic attacks over a period of time. Some people will, might not even be aware that they've had them until they go and have an MRI and the doctor actually sees the the, uh, that the brain has bled from uh, a mini stroke or a regular stroke. And they can have Alzheimer's disease going on exactly the same time. And the Alzheimer's disease is attacking um, the short-term memory first, and then it kind of works its way to other areas of the brain. 
So uh, we typically see this disease um, progress in stages. Okay. And the disease can, my grandmother, for example, had it for 20 years. That's a very, very long time. But the average is eight to 15 years. Oh. Yeah, it's a long drawn out course of disease. And I can't emphasize enough another reason to be prepared for this disease, because if you're going to be involved as either as a caregiver or with a family member, this is not something that's going to disappear in a few months. It's the person who, who has it will live with it for a decade average. That's a long, long time to try to maintain a quality relationship with a loved one that you don't know how to react to or respond to. And there are a lot of quirky things that show up that are part of this disease that um, people really need to have a, a more comprehensive understanding about so they can really do what's what's important and enjoy the time that they have to spend with their loved one without it being a really negative or stressful experience. So I can talk about some of the things that people can expect to give examples. Absolutely. And you're here to share all of the good info. This is what Tea Time is all about, is teaching education awareness. Because without the awareness, we can't change anything. And we're unaware that maybe somebody in our family or a close friend is suffering and they may not understand what's actually going on. So absolutely, Lisa, the floor is all yours. Okay, so this is actually what I do and why I wrote the book. And let me tell you a really quick story about what finally compelled me to write the book. I had, um, I had my own business, I was a consultant and I help people place their loved ones in um, appropriate facilities or were care homes when especially most of the people had dementia. And so I was called over to this one client's house and they kind of had a double whammy going on. Uh, her father had recently been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and her husband's mother had been recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease probably about a year and a half to two years prior to me going over to kind of um, answer their questions. And, and they called me over because they really just wanted to pick my brain. They were at their wits end. They had two parents at the same time um, suffering from, you know, one of the brain diseases that causes dementia. And they just didn't know what to do. So they started asking me questions. Long story short, I spent about two and a half hours answering all their questions. And the woman stopped me and she said, Lisa, I just want to tell you that you've been here about two and a half hours and we've gotten more valuable information from you than we have from any other resource in the last year and a half, two years since the diagnoses. And she said, People are desperate for this information. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to expect. They don't know how to deal with all these day-to-day -day problems and things that, that show up on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just unpredictable. You just never know what you're going to get. And I knew she was right because I've been listening to this for 20 years. And I've, I had many, many families tell me the same thing. And then she says, you really need to write a book and share this information with people because they need it to get by on a day-to-day -day basis. And I had been thinking about it anyway for years. And that was kind of the aha moment for me. And it was right after that, that I sat down and wrote the book and uh, started the blog. So people would have access to this information. And I really haven't seen that much change. People still are telling me that they um, there's a lack of resources out there to deal with the day to day things that come out, come up. So that's what I want to uh, enlighten people about. So with that, let me tell you a couple of true stories that are in my book that kind of illustrate some of the more common behaviors that we see 
And the reason why it's important, because a lot of these behaviors that we see, people really need to understand that it is part of the disease, which is where the disconnect has been. They think Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or Lewy body disease is about one thing. And then they see all these other situations arise. And not only do they believe that their person is their loved one or who, whomever they're caring for is suffering from a brain disease, but they've also gone crazy too. And that's not the case. This is- I, I, I hear that a lot. This is not a mental illness. This is not schizophrenia or- um, I wanted to ask you that. Is it, because a lot of people think that it is a mental illness. No, it's, a, it's, it's the damage that's being done to the brain by whichever brain disease they have. Okay. So once people understand this and they know how to recognize a certain behavior that shows up or symptoms that show up and understand that this is all part of the disease that their loved one has and start recognizing them and then learning how to effectively react or respond to whatever that situation is can make the difference between it escalating into what we call a catastrophic reaction for that person okay. or getting it under control. So one of the things that people are fascinated by is this syndrome called stranger in the mirror that occurs with people with dementia. And it I've, is, heard, I've heard that statement a few times. It's actually more common than most people know. And the reason why it occurs is because when people have Alzheimer's disease and it is attacking the short-term memory, I want you to think about it as if that short-term memory has a switch that could be turned on or could be turned off. In the very beginning stages of the disease, the person's short-term memory is the switch is on more than it's off. And they seem to be fine. As a matter of fact, people can live for years with in the early earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease and the people don't notice because the symptoms and the signs are very, very subtle. Most people are not even diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease till they're already well into their mid stages when it becomes very obvious. Mm -hmm. So in the earliest stages of the disease, the short-term memory is working pretty normally with some hiccups in there once in a while because it just kind of, that switch shuts off. As they progress into the mid stages, switch flips on and the switch flips off randomly. You never know if it's going to be on or off. You have to listen for the cues from the person suffering from the disease to basically tell what they're talking about. And that will be your cue, your, your clue to whether that short term memory is on or off. Because once the short-term memory switch gets flipped off, that person's going to start pulling from their long-term memory, which stays intact for the majority of the disease. But when they're pulling from their long-term memory, in their mind, what they're living in the here and now, they're pulling from somewhere in their past. Oh, and that, that makes a lot of sense. It does, Lisa, because... We always hear the past stories coming up as they get deeper into the Alzheimer's or dementia. Yes. So, so this that does the, make sense. This is the easiest way that I have come up with to explain to people what's happening and really have them connect those dots. So, so if your loved one starts talking about their spouse as if the, that spouse is sitting at home waiting for them. But you know that spouse died five years earlier. You know that short-term memory switch somehow got switched off. But yeah. because in their mind, which is their reality, this is what they believe, 
that switch got turned off and they're pulling from past memories when their spouse was still alive. And there is nothing, unfortunately, that anybody can do or say to correct them or get them, steer them back into your reality. This is their reality for as long as that switch is off. And then anytime it just can flip back on and all of a sudden they're back to your reality, you know, the shared reality. I've I've seen this so many times. I'll tell you one quick story with my mother-in-law who um, suffered from Alzheimer's disease and my sister-in-law was her primary caregiver. And then the rest of us rotated taking care of her on the weekends to give Alice um, a respite. So we had her one weekend and we were sitting in the living room and uh, we were talking and everything was fine. She, we were having a, a very, what seemed to be normal conversation and our realities were in sync. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she stood up and she was like panicked. And she said, you have to take me home. You have to take me home. I have to go home. Marty is sitting there waiting for me. And he's, he's waiting for me to come home and fix his dinner. Now, Marty had been my uh, late father-in-law. And he had passed away about five years earlier. And just something triggered that short-term memory switch to flip off in in an instant. And she's back to uh, an earlier part of her life when she was with her husband and her daily routine every single day was to fix him his dinner. And she started to panic that he would be really worried and really upset if she didn't come home. Well, because I did this professionally, I knew what had just happened. And it was still hard to see this happening to my mother-in-law, but I knew that switch just flipped off and she was in another place in time. So instead of saying to her, which is our gut reaction, we want to just instinctively say, oh, Mom, didn't, don't you remember dad passed away five years ago? Don't you remember that? Well, no, she doesn't remember that. Otherwise, she wouldn't be telling you that he's sitting at home waiting for her. Her memory, her short-term memory just failed. Yeah. And she's pulling from her past. So what I said was, oh, it's okay, Marianne. Marty just called. I talked to him on the phone. He knows we're having a wonderful visit here. And he said, don't worry about it. Just bring her home when she's ready and we'll address dinner when she gets there. I'll make myself a snack. And she says, are you sure? Are you sure? I don't want him to be upset. No, he's perfectly fine. Trust me. He just, I just talked to him. Then she sat down and we picked up where we left off. And then I took her home shortly after that. So it diffused um, a situation that could have really escalated into a panic. But um, one of the things to take into consideration, if I had said to her, don't you remember that Marty passed away five years ago? And I said, no, she didn't remember that. Otherwise, she wouldn't be telling me this story. If I had said that to her, I could have really created um, a very difficult situation for her because in her mind, he was sitting at home waiting for her. He was well and alive and thriving. And if I had told her that he had passed away, that could have sent her into an unbelievable panic. She could have responded by, what do you mean he passed away? Nobody told me. When did this happen? So you have to be really careful how you respond to these false beliefs because the key is that is their reality for that time and this is what they believe is true. So the best way to diffuse the situation is to do what we therapeutically call join their reality. And at some point that switch will go back on and they will be back 
into a synchronized reality with you. But if they're talking about things that they think are happening now that are actually from their past, this is their reality for that time. And there's nothing anybody can do or say to steer them back to your reality, to correct them. And it can, it can do harm to do that because it can really scare somebody and their mind is not fun. Their short, their memory is not functioning properly during these episodes. So you have to do what's best for the person that's having the episode, which is join their reality. Uh, and there are many, many techniques um, available for doing that. It's just, it's like learning a, a new language. Um, if your, if your loved one suffers from hearing loss, um, there are tools out there that can help you communicate with them. There's Braille. I mean, not Braille. There's a sign language. There's <laughs> lips reading. There are all kinds of tools. There's special uh, telephones available for people with hearing loss. It's finding a new way to communicate with somebody with that deficit. Alzheimer's disease, dementia is exactly the same thing. We're not going to stop communicating with them. We're not going to force our old way of communicating onto them because it doesn't work. We have to learn a new way that works for both of you. So these are a lot of the tools and techniques that I uh, bring to people's attention so they can learn this new language, learn these techniques, learn these very specialized skills and have a very enjoyable relationship with their loved one. So Lisa, do you feel that there's enough awareness on the brain illnesses out there? Absolutely not. No way. No, no way. Do you think that we could improve it by talking and sharing and giving the stories out? Undoubtedly. Yes. See, and this is why I, I wanted you on Tea Time, because I wanted you to bring that awareness that there is not enough information out there. I myself went and looked, and there's over 600 different brain illnesses out there in the world, worldwide. And one in six people can get Alzheimer's. Like, it is, the numbers are, I'm not hearing any stories, you know? We need to hear the stories. We need to hear the families speaking out and bringing the awareness. And I really like that you shared that, get into the story with them because for the longest time I was, well, don't you remember? And then they'd be, they get angry and they'd be like, I don't like, why are you saying these things to me? I don't know what you're talking about. And then I realized by reading and researching that I was just triggering them and confusing them more by saying, don't you remember? And I'm glad that you brought that up because we need that awareness out there, not to be doing these things for people who live with Alzheimer's and dementia and any brain illnesses they're already suffering enough. They already are confused. So let's not confuse them anymore by telling them, do you remember? Obviously they don't remember because they wouldn't be talking about these episodes and memories if, if they did remember, like you said, Lisa. So I, wa I want to get into why you are so passionate about this. Besides having family members who have lived with Alzheimer's, Lisa, what is it about Alzheimer's and dementia awareness that is so important to you? Because I've been counseling families for years, I worked in the industry, I, I assessed um, potential uh, residents to come live, whether they were more appropriate for assisted living. I mean, I've, I've lived this day in and day out for years and years and years, and I recognize where the issues are with caregivers, family members, doctors, nurses. And I realized years and years and years ago that the only way we're going to prepare ourselves for the number of people who are projected to develop this disease is to ed be educated, be aware, be prepared. And, um, you know, you just mentioned it yourself, Liz. You said that you have found yourself, and I'm guilty of it too, 
um, that your the natural or instinctive reaction is to respond to somebody by saying, "Oh, don't you remember? Yeah. Remember?" And this is what we do, and it's a it's a natural response. It's an instinctive response. So what we have to do is we have to shift um, people's paradigms and teach them a better or more effective response because it's not the easier way to respond. It's the harder way. Or the easier way is to just come out and say, don't you remember? <laughs> but um, well, I think it's our fear as well, right? We're hearing these stories and we're like, where are these people? Like, why, why are you talking about something that happened 20 years ago? Or you already know that that is past. Why are you bringing this up? You know, so I think it's the fear of us hearing the unknown also puts fear into us. And well, the first instinct is, don't you remember? Yeah, and that's based on our wanting to fix them. We all want our parents to be the way we knew them when they were healthy, or, or we want uh, the people that we care for to be uh, better. And it's just part of our human instinct to want to fix people when they're not right. Yeah. So it's not only trying to steer them back into our reality, but to fix them back to the person they were before they became um cognitively impaired that's yeah. so important to us as adult children we don't we resist seeing the decline in the change in our loved ones when they're suffering from brain disease that causes dementia it's a difficult place to be and it's a difficult place to be for years and years and years and years yeah. because what you will inevitably experience is the progression of the disease getting worse and them declining further and further and further and having to deal with more of these unpredictable and unexpected behaviors and symptoms uh, and not knowing how to navigate those on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, I kind of liken it to the proverbial um, saying in Forrest Gump, where it's like a box of chocolates, you just never know what you're going to get. And that's yeah. basically what living with Alzheimer's disease and other brain diseases that cause dementia um, is really like. You just never know what's going to, what you're going to get on a minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day basis. And if you are, I keep coming back to this word prepared. If you are prepared, and recognize these things that come up as being part of the disease and then know have some tools in your toolbox to effectively address react and respond to them everybody's life is going to be so much simpler so much less stressful and you can really uh, enjoy your relationship with your loved one or the person that you're caring for and then a lot of people um do feel that once they um, receive the diagnosis, either an adult child or the person themselves, that their life is over. And it's not. People can live very meaningful lives with this disease, but it kind of takes a village to make that happen by knowing what to look for, what to recognize, and then how to effectively manage those things that come up. Can I tell you the, uh, finish telling you the story about Stranger in the Mirror? It's really. Um, Absolutely. And right after you share the Stranger in the Mirror, I want to get to know your tea. So we'll get the Stranger in the Mirror and then we'll get your tea and we'll get the final words and any, anybody who would like any information. And we do have a surprise guest who's popping in. I didn't even know she was in my room with me, but. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so Tinkerbell does like to be a star once in a while. She likes to be around me. She has high anxiety, so she's always around me. But I would really like you to share The Stranger in the Mirror, Lisa, and then we'll get into what your tea is. Because okay. I want to know who Lisa is and why Lisa does what she does. Okay. So I brought this up before, and then I think I got sidetracked onto something else. We went into a different story about my mother-in-law. But this is um, to the point why... It's so important to recognize some of the behaviors that show up with Alzheimer's disease. And I'll give you a really good example. So this 
phenomenon is called stranger in the mirror. And it actually um, is quite common. And it has to do with that short-term memory switch being on or being off. But you never know when that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So there's a story in my book about a gentleman who had a relationship with himself in the mirror. The name of the um, story is called Stranger in the Mirror. And it was a perfectly harmless situation where he saw himself in the mirror. He didn't recognize himself because he um, saw an old man in the mirror. And in his mind, he was a younger version of himself because he was at that point pulling from his long-term memory. He wasn't an 80 something year old man. So he, he developed this relationship and this relationship went on for months. He was sharing cookies with him and having conversations And my aunt, my um, aunt, cause this was my uncle would sit in the living room and listen to this relationship go on and on and on. And it was harmless. She really, uh, he enjoyed it and she, and she got a big kick out of it. So she belonged to um, an Alzheimer's support group. And she went to a meeting and she was telling the group about Harold's false belief that this image or his reflection in the mirror was a friend that came every day and visited him. So what the uh, facilitator of the um, support group told her was, yeah, that was a really um, heartwarming story. But another thing that can happen, and it happens quite often with stranger in the mirror syndrome, is let's say you're a caregiver and you want to shower, help uh, the person that you care that you care for with dementia take a shower. And you lead them into the bathroom and they turn and they look at the mirror and they see the, their reflection but the short-term memory switch is not functioning at that time. So they're pulling from their long-term memory. They're thinking they're a younger version of themselves in the past. And they see this old person, older person in the mirror. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they decide they're not going to take a shower. Because they don't want some stranger in the bathroom watching them disrobe. It could be as simple as that, that they saw their own reflection in the mirror and absolutely refused to disrobe with a stranger staring at them and caused this huge ruckus about not wanting to take a shower. But you don't know this. They just refuse all of a sudden. If you are familiar and aware of stranger in the mirror, then as a caregiver or a, a family member, you might realize that it could be what they saw in the mirror is the reason why they're refusing their shower. But if you don't know this, you will never understand that they just simply don't want a stranger watching them. It's an easy fix. You can take them back out of the room. You can cover up the mirror. You can remove the mirror and try again. And this time they wouldn't see their reflection in the mirror and not think a thing about it and um, be perfectly willing to have you help them take a shower. Which makes a lot of sense because a, a, a woman who's really dear to my heart and I call her mom, she's living with a, a brain illness that is not commonly known. And in her room, cause she's in a home they removed all the mirrors. So that makes sense that they've removed the mirrors because this is why. It, it, she was fearful every time yeah. and she wouldn't understand who that person was in the mirror. Well, and that's a really good point because another thing that um, that can really cause a panic is they might not necessarily think that there's some stranger just about to watch them take their clothes off in the bathroom, but a stranger right there in their house, like my grandma that might be there to harm them or to rob them because the point being is they don't recognize themselves because they're pulling from their past memory. Exactly. They're pulling so from the long term. Really, yeah. It can really present a, a very stressful, fearful, 
um, possibly a panic for that person that is experiencing the stranger in the in, in the mirror phenomenon because of the fact that they're, they don't recognize themselves. And if it's not them, it's got to be somebody else because they believe that reflection is a real person. Yeah. It's not a reflection in the mirror. It's a real person staring at them, whether it's in the bathroom or the hallway or wherever. So it definitely can pose a very serious threat to a person um, as we've described. So now I want to get into Lisa. Who is Lisa and what tea does Lisa serve? So if I give you the word the T and I give, I'm asking for a letter, a word for each letter. So the T-E-A, what words would you give me, Lisa? Um, so T. I can't think of any. <laughs> um, we'll come back to T. E, I'm very empathetic. I really, because of my experience, um, not only with my eight family members, the dog I had that suffered from doggy dementia, that's a chapter in my book, um, and just discovering this path for myself and having a 25 plus year um, professional career in helping other families. Because of all that, I have a lot of empathy for what people are going through. I really understand what it is they're going through because I've walked in those shoes myself and I've observed it from a professional standpoint. And it's a very painful, painful process that everybody involved goes through. A, I am one that feels very strongly that we have to acknowledge that this disease is real. It exists. It lasts a very long time. And I've seen it tear families apart. I've seen them split into different camps with one camp believing things should be one way and another. And I think this all comes down to a lack of knowledge and a lack of education, as we talked about before. So I think the first step, like anything else, is to acknowledge that this is a real part of a lot of people's lives. Back to T. I'm really drawing a blank on T. I'm getting the word teach for your T. Teach. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. I, 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 I can see that it wants to come out, but we're over you we overthink, right? When we when we try to serve ourselves, we overthink ourselves because we're so focused on helping everyone else. So we forget who our T's are and who we are. The T is you, Lisa. That's what exactly. You serve. That's so perfect because that's what I do. Is after we acknowledge, people acknowledge that this is um, a serious problem that we live with on a day to day basis. Then I can start opening their minds and teaching them the things that we've talked about today: how to recognize stranger in the mirror and how to recognize when somebody's having a false belief and how to recognize when their short-term memory switch just got flipped off and they're talking about things that don't make sense to you, but they make perfect sense to them because exactly. it's their reality for the time being. See, and your T, is, your T is a strong T, Lisa, because you teach empathy to acknowledge there are changes in the mind. You serve a strong T without even understanding that you're serving a T. And this Thank is what tea time is about. about. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I and I could see that you were struggling, and and I just kept hearing the word teach, teach, teach. She's teaching. She's sitting here. She's teaching. She's serving. She's giving the information, the awareness, and that's all I could see was the word teach. And I heard you say it as you were sharing, tearing families apart, teaching the, an understanding, you know. And this is what we do with 
with tea is we, we share our teas in order for people to understand that we all serve differently. And Lisa, like you really do serve a strong tea. You really bring the awareness. You bring it differently. You bring the 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 real truth to it because you live it. You, you've gone through it. You've experienced it firsthand. And that's how we're going to make a difference. And the awareness of bringing the stories forth is what we need to do. So I really encourage all of the listeners and watchers out there, the viewers, to check out Lisa Skinner and check out her book, grab a copy and share the stories, you know, reach out to Lisa. If you have a story, if you have a family member, I'm sure Lisa would love to connect with you and she would love to join and see how we can make a difference because Alzheimer's and dementia is not spoken about enough. We need that awareness. We need those keys. So Lisa, any final words that you would like to say before we wrap up this tea time? I am more than happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. And you can message me through the blog. It's on Facebook. And it, again, it's the same name as the book, Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost. So don't be shy. I'm very happy to help out any way I can. This is a very important topic and one that is difficult if, if you don't have that awareness. So I'm here for you. I really appreciate you taking the time, Lisa, and sharing your personal story and your personal experience with Alzheimer's. And for all the viewers and listeners out there who are watching the replay, put where you're listening, because I'd love to hear where you're listening from and what topics you would like to see come to Tea Time. So Lisa, thank you again for joining me on Tea Time and sharing your story, sharing the awareness, teaching empathy, acknowledgement is how we're going to serve this cup of tea. So if anybody would like to know more on Lisa Skimmers, please check out her website, check her out on Facebook. And if you have any questions that you would like to relate to Lisa and don't know how to get a hold of Lisa, you could always send them to me and I will relate them to Lisa as well. Uh, I really want to thank you again, Lisa, from the bottom of my heart for bringing the awareness, bringing the truth, the hard truths, and the experience to the table today. So I want to thank all of the viewers that are listening today. And if you have any questions about Alzheimer's or dementia or any brain illnesses out there, please check out your local uh, contacts in your cities, in your countries, because there are different services out there. But I really want you to really connect with Lisa. Lisa is here for a reason. And I want you to connect with Lisa because Lisa has a personal story and she has a personal connection to this illness, the brain illness of Alzheimer's. And Lisa, I want to really thank you for bringing awareness that it's not a mental health illness, because we need that awareness as well. Uh, for myself, I thought it was part of mental health. So I, th I want to thank you for bringing that to my attention, because now I will look further and research deeper into understanding it as well. Um, for all the viewers that are listening, I will be back February 9th with Foreign Language with Jim Curtis from the United States, and he'll be sharing on why we don't educate in our school systems the foreign languages of Russian uh, language and other languages as well. Um, why we're only focusing on certain tongue languages and not in the foreign language. And for anybody who would like to know more about Tea Time, you can check out Miss Liz on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And subscribe to the channel if you like what is coming to the table. There are tough topics that will be coming this, this year to the table because I feel education is important. So again, thank you, Lisa. And thank you to the viewers and listeners who tuned in today and who will tune into the replay. I do appreciate each and every one of you. So thank you. And I will see you February 9th for a new tea time on Miss List, making a difference one cup of tea at a time.